Okay, uh, welcome to another episode of Crime Pays a Bad and He Doesn't. Greetings from beautiful Liberty County, Florida, home of the Jesus Makes Me Horny bumper sticker. That is a trademark bumper sticker, so don't get any ideas about going, you know, a bootleg them yourself. Anyway, uh, we're in a panhandle, Florida panel. We're going to look at some interesting plants going on. We're with my friend Lily. She works for the Native Plant Society here. Let's go take a look, see what we got. Now, you can see we got just a plethora of uh, Tillandsia usneoides up there draping the freaking oaks like uh you know like it's uh, nobody's business okay like it's tinsel but over here we got a uh, opuntia mesacantha look at that look at this guy get those long ass spines nice prickly pear and it is growing on that sandy soil look at those flowers emerging okay you could see the uh inferior ovary right there on a and you got those rudimentary leaves those little green spikes those little green uh, projections are the rudimentary leaves which fall off once that pad matures once that that clad old mature and then right here we got the genus of blueberries vaccinium all right but the berries it produces reportedly taste like hell vaccinium arboreum but look inside those flowers and you can see all those anthers with that style poking on it right look at those anthers poros anthers for the buzz pollination and what the shit and they got those kind of spatulate leaves all right tapering at the base and uh glabrous as hell how about that Sparkle berry, it's called. Vaccine Marborum. Sparkle berry, sparkly berries. Ooh. Hey, don't judge. We're starting to pay attention to Carex. See that right over there? Carex 10X. Same one we got here. All right, there's those paragynia, spirally arranged, forming the female spike, and then you got the male spike up there. But this inflorescence is done. This one over here, where'd it go? All right, there we go. Those, the stigmas are still out. Those paragynia, actually, they've already been pollinated. They're already swelling. And uh, that uh, staminate inflorescence, that male inflorescence, is uh, the anthers out here. Here's, here's a better one. This is one that haven't even been pollinated yet. So those paragynia, those little, those little uh, knobby projections haven't even swollen yet. They're not pollinated. And uh, it's protogynous. So those uh, stigmas are out waiting to get pollinated by windborne pollen before that staminate inflorescence is even uh, elongated and uh, released any pollen. How about that? Exidium arboreum again up there. And then we got Penstemon australis down here all right of course penstemon the genus is most species rich out west oh look at the glands on it holy hell look at the glands on a stem even on the corolla on the sepals the calyx etc penstemon australis look at it and you got the little beard you of course you got those uh hair like uh projections on that lower lip right there or that bilateral symmetrical flower old style right there this one's already been pollinated and the curl's already fallen off Okay, so I dissected this flower. Might as well, you know, give you a good intro to penstemon flower morphology. So that hairy shit, that's the stamino, that's just a sterile stamen, okay? Those are the actual stamens in the back. There's four of them. They're at two different levels. Look at how those anthers dehiss, like little boomerangs. And then behind those four stamens, you have the uh, the style, that little, just that little white uh, cylinder, little white rod right there in the background. So uh, some some penstemons, that's a diagnostic feature, that beard tongue, that's the common name for it. It's kind of a stupid name, but just that hairy staminode. Sometimes it can be hairy, sometimes it can be nude. Oh, this one, okay, now see, this is not the right season for this, but this is what it looks like when it's germinating. Eupatorium capillifolium, okay, really great plant. They get about six feet tall. You know, sometimes when I want to put my mind to sleep, I do occasionally watch TV, though I absolutely abhor cable, namely because of the commercial, so I don't have a cable thing, but I did stream Walking Dead once, and I noticed there was a lot of Eupatorium capillifolium uh, making a, a photobomb on the set of uh, The Walking Dead. So this is a great plant, Stevia tribe, Eupatoria, Asteraceae, the sunflower family. Look at that, Michella repens. Look at that, I've seen this in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan up there. We had to go up there a couple years ago. Look at that, coffee family, Rubiaceae. Opposite leaves, and look, you got a tube-shaped flower as well. All right, almost looks like a Houstonia or something. Look at look at the hairs on the on the petals right there as well. How about that? See, there's the fruit, little red berry. Okay, so now you could see we're walking through the woods. Lily, where are we going? We're going down to see Magnolia Ashii, the Ash Magnolia. Okay, tell us about this landscape. You got these ravines and stuff. Yeah, we're kind of in the ecotone between the upland pine sand hills and the slope forest ravines. And this was a coastline, you know, only a couple dozen thousand years ago? This is the, right along where the prehistoric coastline was in Florida. And so there's a lot of topography. These, would, these uplands would have been ancient sand dunes. So they're very deep sand. 
Look at that. Look, it looks like I just leaved out sassafras alburum. Oh, Loraci, the avocado family. Let's make MDMA. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very beneficial, you know, in terms of a therapeutic clinical usage, right? And it does, it is derived from, sa from uh, saffron, but, you know, you need like a dump truck full of leaves. Also, saffron is mildly carcinogenic and it's got to be further refined. Anyway, uh, wonderful tree right there. It does smell very good. It smells kind of like root, root beer. How about that? And then, of course, you get that Magnolia grandiflora right there in the background, you know? But if you do have PTSD, and a lot of people do in this society, and there's probably going to be a lot more that have PTSD at the rate we're going, you know, it's something to think about. You don't get too many of these no more, right? Tell me well, about we this. we have plenty of them, but they're all just re-sprouts from the main trunks that have died back because an invasive beetle, the ambrosia beetle, has introduced bay laurel wilt, which is a fungus that when the beetle bores into these trees, it infects the entire tree and the root system that continues to re-sprout will still be infected. And so a lot of our bay trees are dying and even the avocado industry. In so Florida, anything in Loraceae kind of, it affects anything in Loraceae. most of them, yeah. But a lot of hurricane damage, so the canopy's open, so all this other stuff's coming back, all right? Disturbance event creates a bunch of light openings for chance for other other species to thrive. Anyway, look at this, Nidoscolus stimulosis, ooh. The genus Nidoscolus, of course, in Texas, we get Nidoscolus texanus. Uh, I don't think you get you don't get any out in California, but you get plenty in Mexico, many of them tree size. And there's one from Chiapas that's uh, an edible food crop. It obviously doesn't have those uh, stinging hairs. Uh, Euphorbiaceae, poinsettia family. Okay, this one is, but this is the biggest. This gets Tex Texana gets I don't know two three feet tall, and there's some again that from uh, like Oaxaca, Puebla area that get uh, tree sized and can really send you to the hospital if you get stung with a bunch at once. There we go, Pinus echinata, short leaf pine, needles and fascicles, a two, sometimes three. There's the cones, and there's that uh, that platy bark you could see. Eh, it's kind of dark right there because it's backlit. But it's one of like four or five pine species you get down here in northern Florida. Beautiful Pinus palustris longleaf pine up there, and look how big, look how big that, uh oh, the dog's puking. The dog's puking. What were you doing? Were you eat? Oh, that's nice, Louie. Good job. Anyway. Uh, dog puke's a nice metaphor. I can roll with it. Look at that cone, too. Look at that large cone. Uh, and uh, look at the bark as well. All right, as opposed to being platy, it's more flaky. And these are a more fire-adapted pine. All right? So that's, that's a more fire-adapted bark. All right? Very beautiful. Wish I saw more of these. But more slow-growing than loblolly or slash pine. So, you know, that's what the lumber industry's been planning. is the faster-growing stuff. The loblolly and the slash. All right, we need to be doing more Pinus palustris just in general, not even to cut, just to restore ecosystems, brick. All right, here we got a member of the walnut family, and the leaves smell like it. Caria tomentosa. Okay, it's a hickory. Look at those galls in there, all right? Caria, of course, same genus as pecans, uh, which, again, are in a walnut family as well. Look at the texture on those, those stems. Oh, my God. Look at those little hairs and stuff. And, again, fragrant, all right? They got a very specific smell to them, almost like walnut leaves. Look at that, we got a hemiparasite from the family Orobankaceae, which is almost entirely a family of hemiparasites, Oriolaria, Oriolaria virginica, but we're not going to see any flowers, the flowers later in the year. Real nice plant though. My scrotum in a vacuum cleaner, worked a lot better than a steam cleaner, I put my scrotum in a vacuum cleaner for God. Well, we got it, just, we've been listening to classic country, so, you know, you get these songs stuck on your head, and then you just, you know, you don't know the lyrics, so you slightly alter them with whatever comes naturally, and that's how we end up here. Anyway, Lily, tell us what we're looking at here. This is a rare guy, huh? This is Magnolia ashii. For a long time, it was lumped in with Magnolia macrophylla, but it's now recognized as a distinct species. And it is endemic to this area of Florida in the panhandle here. And it has super large leaves. These are just starting to leaf out. And oh. They have these big dinner plate size, extremely fragrant and intoxicating flowers. So these go dormant in the winter, it's just a bunch of sticks. Yep. And then look, but so so these are these already bloomed. Some already bloomed, but then there's some that haven't bloomed yet, huh? Oh my God, so this very, look at that, the, the petals already fell. So tell us about the pollination of this guy. So they do not effectively reproduce anymore and some research has been done. They definitely, it's beetle pollinated, but they think, they hypothesize that the beetle that was the most effective pollinator for this species has gone extinct because they are not super successful at reproducing anymore. It's a nice andropogon, you know, 
Still pretty, uh, pretty, you know, rookie at grasses, but I know one Andrew Pogon when I see one. And anyone who's watching is sometimes you see those on the sides of the freeway if you're lucky enough to be in a place where they don't mow. You know, but everyone loves mowing in this fucking country. It's, uh, it's indicative of a, uh, of a cultural disease. Which magnolia diversity? Magnolia pyramidata. Get those, uh, get those glabrous petioles and those leaves. See, there's one over there. Those, see that? Can you see right there? That guy right there. Look at the way those new leaves come out. How about that? Here we go. Monotypic genus, a shrubby monotypic genus in Euphorbiaceae. Ditracinia is the genus here. Look at that. There's, you got the flower spike. Oh, look at that. Not ready yet. The leaves do smell like hell. All right. In keeping with uh, Euphorbiaceae, look at that kind of red, red uh, tinge to the margins of those leaves. Holy hell. That's a nice one. This, this ought to be planted more. All right. Especially the leaves of so many Euphorbs get a really cool look to them with that uh that kind of red that those anthocyanin pigment that's for janine i was going to ask you what you do with this this is for like a skin point ointment or something what you do with that uh i watch it be pollinated i don't know what you do with you it. get annoyed when people ask you uh, what you do what's it for it is kind of annoying right it it's kind of a weird way yeah, <laughs> what's it do annoying. it functions as an it's integral function. part of an ecosystem that's what it does that's, that's what it does it provides ecosystem services for all of us so this is hamamelis virginiana our native witch hazel. We have a couple of, um, well, one very rare species in Florida, Hamamelis obedes, uh, and this one is pretty common in these slope forests. Nice, look at that, very distinct leaf shape and texture as well. How tall does it get? Mm, maybe 10 feet. And yes. when do they bloom? They bloom in the winter, huh? They bloom in the winter, yeah, okay. late fall and winter. Okay, nice. Look, one of like 10, one, 10 Ilex species, same genus as Yerba Mate, Ilex opaca. I look so picky, opaca. Look at that though. See that with those very look at, how, look at the margins. Got those spinose tips on them. Super glabrous, but when you turn it over, you got a nice soft, glutinous texture to it. How about that? I look so opaca in bloom. So much holly diversity, and then you get yet you get none out west. All right, and of course the the yerba mate, the one you drink, that Ilex is from South America. And have four petals with stamens alternating with the petals. Ooh. Who's this guy? What's he doing over there? Some sort of caterpillar eating the beauty berry, the Calicarpa americana, which is in the mint family Lamiaceae. Nibbling it down. Wonder if he's going to be some kind of nice mouth or well, You got to pay attention to those fucks. You really do. They're really great, right? You, you know, I, I used to never go think I'd go mothing. And then suddenly I was, you know, I had the black light out there with the sheet. I'm looking at all kinds of moths. All the dumb shit people do with their time. No offense to anybody, of course. Uh, you know, mothing is not a bad idea, but you gotta, you gotta pay attention to those, uh, those caterpillars you see. Look at this. It'd be nice if I could show you flowers, but we don't have any at the moment. We may not see them, so I figure I'd get them anyway. Oxydendrum arboreum, Ericaceae, all right? So many cool members of Ericaceae, the blueberry family, that you don't get out west, that you get on the east coast, all right? You can see this guy just leafed out. Very soft and gentle leaves. Look at the glabrous texture to those distal leaves, and as well as some of those anthocyanin pigments. But on the older leaves, you can see they get a little, little bit bigger. Little ursulate, urn-shaped, blueberry-looking flowers when they mature. Over here, uh, we got another species of Ilex. Ilex coriaceae. Looks like something was nibbling on it with those indistinct uh, little white flowers that pop out of the leaf axles right there and a whole glabrous glabrous next i wonder if this has caffeine in it too just like ilex vomitoria could be see there's the flowers on that ilex you don't got four petals you got how many freaking petals you get in there are they just four and they're they're dissected they're low but you got eight stamens in there right but again just little little white uh little white flowers just poking out the leaf axles go fuck yourself of course we got our red maples water lovers acerubum which i always love using as an example to discuss things like ecotypes because that tree grows way down in South Florida and also grows up in Maine. So, you know, that's why ecotypes become important. You're not gonna wanna plant acerubrum that grows in Maine in Florida or vice versa because they've spent thousands of years, uh, maybe a little bit more, evolving in those specific environments and climates, uh, etc. Get the sandy bottom lanes, oh, that's nice. Anyway, look right there. Virginia Sweet Spire is a common name for that. Okay, which again, kind of a dumb common name, but whatever. Itea virginica is what I call it, which is a member of uh, an ITA seed family, order saxifragilis. You can see those white flower spikes just about finishing up. All right. Saw this guy in uh, Louisiana too. It was a very important plant to, to put in Louisiana because it likes that, uh, at least southern Louisiana, because it likes that waterlogged soil. Oh, there we go. I know this guy. This is one of my favorites, Simplocos tinctoria, a member of the order Ericales, the blueberry order, and it's even got... 
uh, a species of Exobasidium fungus that parasitizes it, like many of the Ericaceae and Ericales members do here in the southeast. Exobasidium is a really cool fungus that mimics flowers uh, so that the insects will help spread its spores, presumably. So there's those flowers, all right, just poking right out the stems. Look at that. Dozens of stamens and then kind of, uh, kind of concave petals. Is it only one series? Are there sepals too? Yeah, there's sepals it looks like. I can't even really tell. Anyway, we'll just avoid talking about that for now because I don't want to give you bad dope. But very important tree. I love this tree. Okay, it's like a small tree. You don't see it get too big. All right, in, in, in southern Louisiana, it was uh, blooming, blooming a few months ago, but here it's still going off. Now, here's a tree that always makes me feel a little gay, okay? Like I want to go hit the trough urinal at the, at the rest stop, okay? This is Fagus Americana, American peach. Look at that new foliage on it, okay? These, of course, are large trees, but this is a seedling coming up probably, I don't know, what, four or five years or something? Real banger. And, of course, you get some really cool parasites that, uh, uh, you know, there's a parasite in Orban Casey that uh, parasitizes this that you'll find uh, growing at the... The base of it, but that foliage, look at the color on it. Oh my god, with those anthocyanin pigments on it. Oh, that's one too. Look at that. That's they got the most beautiful bark as well. Oh, that's look at that sourwood oxydendrum. Look at it. Look how big they get. A tree sized member of the blueberry family, just like the matrones you get out west. Look at this. You got all these ants farming a scale on this magnolia. Look at that little bastards, you know. But I guess you know, something's gonna eat the ants, right. Maybe one of them lizards with some little linole or something, but look at it, it's just covered. Oh my God, it looks like a bunch of barnacles. All right, so like, it's like the magnolia has herpes. It's so close to an ash. In fact, it looks like some of the fraxinus I've seen. Cyananthus virginicus. Okay, it looks like Chianthus. Those are the flowers, look at that. Just, just four petaled flowers. Ash family, olive family, oleaceae. Hasn't even leafed out yet, just starting to leaf out. It's doing a, getting the flowers out there first. Look at that, we got a magnolia ash I am blooming. There's a bunch of beetles in there. Whoa, I'm perched precariously on a sketchy rotting log about, I don't know, 15 feet off the forest floor. So we'll see how this pans out. Look at that flower though. Look at all those stamens, these cupped down. See, the stamens already fell off, so this is kind of a late stage flower. Look at it, the guy's crawling. It's like the ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese. You know, I puked in a ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese back in the days when it was called Showbiz Pizza. Remember that? when they had the animatronics. Nobody uses animatronics anymore. Anyway, the beetles just flew out. I wish I could have gotten some better money shots. It smells very nice. It smells very nice. Oh, that smells so nice. That smells so nice in there. What are you doing? Look, they're banging in there. There's guys under there too. They just look like they fall asleep. You know? Ah, oh, God, magnolias are so cool. There's some really cool cloud forest ones in Mexico. And a Dominican. Oh, I just spelled those guys. Sorry, guys. Sorry about that. Yeah, so here we go. We got a member of the cherry genus. Look, Prunus alabamensis. This is endemic to this region, okay? Because we're right near the Alabama border. Oh, yeah. That's nice. But see that dentate margin on the leaves? All right, good giveaway for Prunus, all right? One of the one of the, the plant genera that's pretty easy to detect just by looking at the leaves. Flower spikes mostly done. There's a plant that you actually see in native landscaping, or just in general landscaping, Hydrangea cursifolia. Cursifolia because the leaves look oakish, right? But it's member Hydrangea family. All right, and then uh, we got cinnamon fern down there. What is that? What you, osmanthus? Osmundastrum. Osmundastrum. And then tell us about this. You're telling us about this just yeah. in leaf, this right but it's here, a great fucking there genus. There are a bunch of seedlings of Liatris golsonii, and, and this has an extremely wide leaf for a Liatris. Right, because they normally got like grass like needle like so leaves. This is we have in Florida that occurs in shady moist areas which is unusual for liatris which typically occur in very sunny open drier areas but this is so this is a Florida endemic to just this region of Florida it, it's liatris golsonii it was described and named by a mentor of mine who just passed away last year Lauren Anderson who is an incredible botanist in North Florida he named it after Angus Golson, who is also another incredible botanist who is from this region of Florida, Chattahoochee area. What do the flowers look like on our... They look like Liatris. But just kind of like a pink? Yeah, purple. I would say lavender color flowers. I can send you some pictures for you to share. And yeah, they're lovely. But they, what's so cool about them is they bloom and grow in shady, moist areas. So they're a lot more um, adaptable to... Um, yards than a lot of liatra species if you don't have full sun and a whole lot of you know well-drained soil you can't grow most liatras but this species you can grow and it wasn't described until really recently i think in like maybe 2011 
So it's a pretty new species. This is what I get for singing about putting my scrotum in a vacuum cleaner. You know, I guess the tick heard the song. He's trying to go for it, you little prick. Isn't it incredible? Oh, that's nice. God damn it, that's nice. Look at those stingers. So you got those poros ant, those porocidal anthers. See that? They got a little hole at the end of them because they need that buzz pollination, all right? Like, like so many members of Eric Casey, the blueberry family. Rhododendrons, azaleas, always such a pleasure to see. Look at that. God damn it. This has got to be, what do you think, hummingbird pollinator? What's the main pollinator of this? Butterflies and hummingbirds. No shit, look A lot of, like, giant swallowtails you see on this, other swallowtail species. Look at all the hairs on those corollas, too. God damn it. And probably some very interesting mycorrhizal activity going on on the ground. This is nice. A woodland orchid, Spiranthes sylvatica. Many species of Spiranthes. Look at how those, look at how those flowers spiral around. That spike, god damn it, what a great, what a great genus of orchid. Oh yeah, look at that, look at that labellum, look at that fancy stuff. Well, you see the yellow, are those the pollinia in there? Yep. Those little pollen granules, holy shit. Look at all the little hairs and stuff too. What do the leaves look like down there? Just a single leaf. All right, another indicator of a good mycorrhizae in that soil. All right, it's associated with some of the mycorrhizal fungus that all these trees are probably associated with. And you know pines being ectomycorrhizal always also mean there's going to be a good good fungal biota in that soil. Look at it. Look, this is all hurricane damage. That's nice, though. I like the disturbance. This is what you got to do in a native garden once in a while. you got to be the disturbance that enables the diversity. Look at this honeysuckle. Nice native honeysuckle. Lonicera sempervirens. What do you think pollinates that? Probably a hummingbird with that long red tubular flower. Maybe a butterfly as well. Got the opposite leaves and it, of course the vine smell coming from those flowers. Mine, I'm full of shit. They, they don't smell. Okay, but they do look nice. They look nice. Look at all that pollen just coming off oons just like that. Just the big splooge of pollen about that. This is cool. A lot of people don't know these guys, Aurelia spinosa, are actually related to carrots. Same order. Apiales. All right. I've seen them get tall, too. I saw a 30-foot tall one in uh, Louisiana. Look at those spines. That's why they call it spinosa. But very distinct, all right, with those, uh, you know, those those, sheath, those sheathing petioles and those uh, odd pinnate leaves. Magnolia virginiana right there. You got four magnolia species. Tripetala, pyramidata, grandiflora, uh, virginiana, ashii. There's, I think there's another one around here. Palustris, look at it. This ain't the grass stage, but it was in a grass stage. How do you think this is? Six, seven years? No, it could be younger than that, but around that age. God, they're so nice. Why do they so do that? So it's in the really fast growth age that? right now where it has this tender apical bud that is, you know, not as fire resistant. So it's trying to shoot up above the fire line really quickly. It's a tender wizard. Would you call that a tender wizard? I would call this a tender wizard. It almost looks like Xanthoria, that Australian genus. God damn. So it's trying to shoot up above the fire line really quickly so it don't get burned again. But if it does get burned, can it sprout back? They get burned when they're just young or no? Not if this apical bud dies. But that's why it's trying to push it up as quick as possible. You know, always got to pay attention to the fascicles. Bundles of three. Needles of three, all right? As opposed to five or two. Or in the case of Pinus, some of the Pinus edulis, one. Quercus laurifolia. Look at the new growth on that. Those anthocyanin pigments. Some of the oaks, when they're putting out the flushes of new foliage, God, they look so good. And that's got to be a fast-growing oak, too. I mean, look, this is all this is all new. You got eight inches of growth in the first month. Ain't yeah, this thing, it. Smilax pumula. Look at it. It's a lot of Smilax. They're normally vines. Some of them have thorns, okay? But this guy is like a ground cover. It doesn't get low, okay? This should be great for plant. Look at that sandy soil, sandybags.com. I'm kind of pro-hurricane, got to admit it. It does, look at that. It removes the canopy. Makes it a lot more open. I tend to be a fan of more of the open, exposed environments, not the dark, shady forest. And look, those, those, uh, those Pinus pellucris, those longleaf, tend to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, wind resistant, pretty flexible when they're growing out in the open like that. Look at that beautiful, such a beautiful tree. A higher, a little drier, a lot sandier. So we got species we more, more common to see in the arid west. Areogonum. This is Areogonum tomentosum, not flowering. One of the buckwheats, Polygonaceae, the buckwheat family. Areogonum is a huge fucking genus. Out west, right? Like 250 species, probably 300 species, quite a few unnamed. All right, they do so well in those dry environments. I'm surprised to even see one in Florida. There's one or two other species here, and then of course, uh, in the state of Florida, I mean. And then uh, we got right there, we got our longleaf. All right, in the grass stage, see that it looks like a bunch grass. Quercus and cana, okay. The oak trifecta are Quercus and cana, Laurifolia and Labus. All right, Labus and cana are indicative of the sandybags.com, the sandy soils, the sand hills. 
okay? More arid, uh, arid adapted species, and they all get, uh, they all form decent trees. A nice peas, Tephrosia virginiana. Look at that flower, look at a white banner. Remember those peas, you got the banner petal, that white one, the two wing petals, the pink ones, and then the keel, which uh, has uh, the ovary and the 10 stamens in there. All right, diadelphus stamens, nine fused together, one free. Tephrosia is a cool genus, get a really nice one on the Texas sand sheet. All right, I don't think, you get many out west, I don't think so. Harry Kayla says, you prick, look at that, whoa. Ever looked at longleaf pine bark on acid? And we look at this, look, we got a species of gay lusatia. Eric Casey, look at those ursi lit flowers, okay? Edible berries, little edible berries, ooh. And glabrous leaves with those uh, red petioles. And uh, looks like they're a little bit, uh, they told me to know they're glabrous on the underside too. A little bit of a dentate margin on those leaves, how about that? Okay, this, so we got another gay lusatia. That was Dumosa I just showed you, which means small. And this is gay lusatia. Nana, which also means small. Kind of weird about that. The the common name for this is golden. Okay, you ready? You ready? Dwarf dangleberry. Okay, sometimes you get, you don't wipe properly, you get the dangleberries. All right, but edible fruits. And again, uh, Eric Casey, blueberry family, probably has some very rich mycorrhizae. And look at that glabrous, glabrous foliage. Look at the venation on that too. Look at that. Very, very distinct texture of venation. Looks like you got some, some, uh, with punctate glands in there. How about that? And uh, right here, we got Opuntia mesacantha, which I showed you earlier, going off with a beetle inside there. And those stamens are thigmonastic. So when something touches them, they tend to close up on it, making sure that the pollinators get dusted with pollen. You gotta get out of there. You can't stay there. Never a genus to be left out of a North American ecosystem, Euphorbia. This is Euphorbia floridana. Look at that. Not endemic to Florida, but, uh, you know, you get it, uh, I think you get it in Georgia and uh, southern Alabama as well. But look at that, glabrous, and you get that beautiful blue, that kind of dark green, blue-green color. And then there's those cyathea, all right? Cyathea are inflorescences, so there are many flowers inside each cyathium. Of course, does it bleed? Does it bleed that uh, white latex? Oh, there you go. Just like a milkweed, which it's not related to, it bleeds that white latex and of course some of the south african species even the mexican ones are very very toxic they'll send you to the hospital especially if you get it in your eyes look at this another species rich genus right here croton euphorbiaceae same family as the one i just showed you look at that look at those scales on there and even even more impressive look at those three styles poking out of those ovaries croton can be monoecious or dioecious that is you know unisexual flowers on the same plant in monoecious or different plants, unisexual flowers and different plants, in dioecious. Okay, this croton is apparently monoecious. Those female flowers, when they are monoecious, are always on the bottom. So you got pistillate flowers on the bottom, got the ovary, got the three style branches. Okay, well, of course, when those uh, when the pollen's uh, deposited on those uh, those on those three stigmas, it'll uh, swell that ovary. You'll get a fruit, and then these uh, to probably to avoid cross pollination, this, the the staminate ones, the male flowers, have not opened up yet, but that's what those little buds are. Look at all the little orange scales and shit. I gotta love croton. What a nice, what a fucking nice genus. Orange stems. All right, some get big. You know, we get some real nice ones in Texas that get like almost small tree size. It's euphorbia exalted yeah, right euphorbia here. Euphorbia exalted. That's another nice one. Yeah. That's this carista. Yeah, we get this genus in Texas. What species is this? Is this you said? Oblongifolia. This carista. Oblongifolia. It can't they see. Look at it. Opposite leaves. Lamialis is the order. Zygomorphic flowers. You got hairs in there? Inside that Corolla? Eh, maybe a little bit. I don't know. I can't really see. Look at those stamens open. I know. God damn. Yeah, I just cut a tiny tick on myself. Yeah, tiny euphorbia. ticks. That's why you gotta burn. You gotta burn. Get rid of the ticks. Who doesn't like burning? Fuck you, Smokey the Bear. Look at those tiny flowers. Oh my. You know what, Lily? I promise not to pass gas while we're huddled down here. <laughs> okay, I'll hold it. Yeah, look at that ovary. Wait, you got the stamens in there too? You got a little anther in there? Yeah, look at it. Oh, look at that little yellow anther. Yeah. Tiny. Look at those red bricks. What's doing a pollinating on this? Something small probably, huh? Very small. God damn it. Look at this. You got all this corcus and cane, all that all that turkey yolk, all right? Shouldn't be that much. It's, it's indicative of fire suppression, but you got all that nice tephrosia. You got that smilax pumula coming up. And you got the... Uh, look, here's the nice inflorescence on, the, uh, on this croton. Look at that. See those stamens? What a great genus, all right? Kind of a pain in the ass to figure out what species you're looking at, but just get it down to croton. That's good enough. Croton, however you want to pronounce it. Those, those, beautiful, those beautiful leaves with those scales on them. 
Staminate flowers, and then uh, this one doesn't even have any uh, pistillate flowers on it that I can see. Look at this, same genus as Papa is the beloved Papa, Asimina, Ananaceae is the family there. Look at those flowers. All right, one of the more basal angiosperms, and you'd guess it by looking at those flowers. Look at that, look at those green ovaries in there. God damn it. Look at that, almost like uh, very elongated oblong leaves. See, this is my kind of habitat, but I would burn, again, I'd burn all that, get rid of the oaks, all right, or at least reduce them. Otherwise, they get too dominant, get shaded out in a few years. You got that arista. The main grass here, it's from this ground cover, is aristida. That croton is so nice, too. God, croton and tef tefrosia really doing their thing. Look at this one. Remember the silphium tribe, Berlandiera, Berlandiera pumula, okay? Look at those very distinct fibers, just like you'd see on any species of silphium, which if you live in the Midwest, don't know what silphium is, you got to come correct to figure that one out, because that's a great one. These smell like cocoa. Something already nibbled on those damn ligules. Look at that nice foliage, too. Tome and toast, woolly, especially on the underside, and uh, forms a little rosette. You can't see it here. There's one over there that uh, was going off. I would assume only the uh, the marginal akines, the ligulate akines, produce seed. Like many of them. Look at those individual corollas on those two. Like, like, got like a nice blood red color on them. God damn, that's nice. Five lobed blood red corollas with the black anther tubes and then the little yellow styles poking out. Right? The ones on the margins have already are already done. So... Oh, I'm curious about that. Most silphiums, they only produce viable seed on the outside. She said we're right coming between the Ecotomba, between the sand hill and a slow forest over there. Is that what you said? Yeah. I figured what she said. Anyway, look at this Smilax auriculata, okay? Very species-rich genus in the east, all right? A lot of them have thorns, can be a pain in the ass, but still, you got to respect it. Look at the flowers on that, too. Monocot, it's a monocot vine. God, I think I can feel chiggers on my on my scrotum right now. It's not very nice. Look at, that, look at the long leaf, the grass stage. That's the good, what you call the grass stage. You call it the grass, look how nice that is. Love that stuff. What's that? This is a very early blooming. It must have been triggered somehow, but this is Symphia trichum plumosum, the plume aster. It's a Florida endemic. And it's very similar. It was for a long time, it was lumped in with Symphia trichum concolor, but plumosum has these recurved Filleries with um, pubescence uh, all over. You got them. a shit ton of symphiotrichum down yeah, here, right? Yeah, we got a lot. Very species rich genus. Look at those anther tubes. What the shit? Oh, that, look! Look at all the. It's, that's just the pappus you can see sticking out those hairs, huh? Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ! There's no more corollas in there. I guess there gotta be. Look at those white corollas, though. That's nice. That is a nice one. Who's been munching on these? Again, vaccinium. Another extremely species rich genus down here. Vaccinium staminium. Pretty easy to remember. Sounds kind of ridiculous when you say it like that, but not a very, not an especially tasty species of blueberry, so I'm told, and kind of a weird flower morphology compared to the rest, but you can still see those anthers poking out. I can't really see any pores on them, but I'm sure they're probably there if you look close. Maybe they're not, who knows? Those long things sticking out are the styles, okay? And uh, don't got any fruits maturing yet. So many, so many freaking vaccinium. They love this uh, acidic sandy soil. Damn, this one's nice, Amsonia ciliated. We get plenty of Amsonia in Texas, especially in the desert. A lot of them are moth pollinated. Apocinaceae, same family as milkweed, but a different subfamily. Look at those, uh, how long is the period? You got kind of a tube on there. I wonder who's pollinating these. Probably some sort of butterfly or moth. Some really cool ones in the Chihuahua Desert that bloom at night. Look at this, look at all the freaking iron deposits you're getting in the sand here. Love that. That's definitely a rock you want. You want to take home with you. All right. Always take. Always take the rocks. It's fine. Everybody said it's fine. Talk to him. He said it's fine. I talked to the guy. He said it was fine. Look at that. There's that cinnamon for an osmondastrum. I can see where they call it that name. Look at that sporophyll. Okay. All right. These are sterile leaves right here, and uh, just just vegetative leaves. And then that, of course, is the sporophyll. That's where the spores are being released from, or where they will be released from. Maybe not being released yet. Oh, juicy. Look at that. No, it looks like they're definitely being released. I can't tell. Anyway, real nice fern. Doing well here in these, uh, this, this uh, very mesic woodland. So as you can see, we came down to a more mesic woodland out of the sand hills. And this is, you know, this is somewhat offensive. I don't know why it's got to smell like that. Nice plant, but those flowers, they really kind of smell like splooge and feet or something. I don't know, but I guess it smells great if you're a fly. Anyways, viburnum. Acerifolium, Acer the genus of maple. So, so basically, the species of it that talks about how the leaves of this look like like uh, like Acer leaves, like maples. Look at those bracts, huh? Look at it, look at look at the stipules right there. Nice. Anyway, uh, you could see those stamens coming off uh, there. So you got a corim of uh, flowers right there. And again, they don't smell very good, but it is somewhat of a rare plant. Viburnum viburnaceae, Dipsicales is the order. 
right there. You no, know, it don't smell so bad, but this is a nice antidote to it, those rhododendron, those azalea flowers. Okay, again, it's at that uh, rhododendron australium. Look at it. God, I smell incredible. So nice. Over there, you can see there's a bunch over there. I'm behind that tree. Look at that guy. Look at that. Look, you got palms in here. Rapetophyllum hysterix, the needle palm. Didn't expect to see a palm in these woods, huh? The Magnolia ashii again. Look, you got a beetle gangbang in there. Jesus Christ, guys. Not even the Germans do stuff like this. Look at that. Mess and soil pollination. That's what this is called because the beetles go in there and they just they just tear shit up. They just, you know, they just get it all. Look at it. There's stamens. They ripped all the stamens off. I guess it was probably just maybe naturally dehissed. All right, all the stamens. And then, of course, magnolia flowers, you got those carpels up top. Protogynous. So maybe they got hit already. Magnolias break it up, okay? Protogynous. Look at it. What, what the shit is going on? Jesus. Guys, come on. What are you doing? Huh? You got an audience. What a great, what a great species. A Florida endemic. Look at that. Smell, I can smell it from here. Incredible. Look, and those leaves, too. Look at, look at how big those leaves are. Jesus Christ. Almost, almost, almost two and a half feet long. Look at this. We got a native bamboo. Most bamboos you see planted in gardens certainly are native. This one is Arundinaria tecta. In the bamboo, uh, what is it, tribe? I think it's a tribe. Bamboo soidae. <coughs> God, Jesus Christ. Anyway, a native bamboo, Arundinaria tecta. Oh, look, who's that? You got a little caterpillar hanging on there? That Rapetophyllum hystrix, that Rapetophyllum hystrix again. Look at that. Nice fan palm. Look how long those petioles are. Growing in an understory of uh, just the, this hardwood forest. Loving these wet, moist areas along streams. We got Leucothui. Look at that. Another ericaceous, another ericaceous bastard. Again, you got those ursulid Ur flowers. This is Leucothui axillaris. You got, that, I don't know, three or four species in a genus. Uh, in this region, again, those, those beautiful ursula flowers. Look at those, those green stigmas poking out. And, of course, you got those. If you were to cut that flower open, you'd have those porosidal anthers in there. Like so many members of the Ericaceae, such a distinct flower shape. Okay? Not edible. Because I know someone's going to ask it. Someone's always asking it. Look at, look at, the, look at that red color, that red tinge to those, uh, those bracts. See those anthocyanin pigments. A lot of Ericaceae do that. They have that specific, like, tint to the, uh, the new foliage. Look at that, another understory palm. Look at that, Sable Miner. She's getting Texas too. Dwarf Palmetto. How about that? Look at that. God damn it. Yeah, woodland, woodland yucca. Well, it's growing on the sand. We're, we're, we're at the base of a sand hill. Yucca filamentosa. See the hairs? See where that species name comes from. Oh, look at those red sands. Lots of iron in them sands. Right here we are in the Torreya Formation. Named after the genus of plant we're about to see. You can see that uh, those iron-rich sands. Miocene sands, roughly, I don't know, 12 million years old about. Go off into the brush a little bit to see two Pleistocene relics. Nice. All right, endangered conifers. Texas Floridana right here. The Florida U, which is uh, endemic to the uh, Florida panhandle. Look at that. God damn. You got two U species in the United States. You also got uh, that uh, Pacific U. Out there in Northern California, Oregon, and I think uh, Washington as well. Does it go on up into Canada? I don't know. Anyway, two two U species. Taxus is the genus, and then the uh, somewhat closely related Florida Torreya, which is dying back to uh, due to an introduced Fusarium fungal rat, which we got over here. So these are kind of uh, let's see where the hell where the hell did it go? I'm gonna hop over this freaking magnolia grandiflora. Christ. I oh, see they got a cage over it. Right, same family as that you tax AC. And looking somewhat similar, but with with uh, much more needle-like leaves, a little bit more stiff, not as friendly. That uh, Torreya taxifolia. Of course you got and just like the you, you got another species on the west coast. Uh, which uh, they colloquially refer to as California nutmeg, even though it's not a nutmeg. But they both get this, uh, it's not a fruit, it's a, 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 micro, a macro strobilis. It's a cone, looks like a little green, a little green sack hanging. But these are dying back to the, uh, due to the fungus. Lily, you want to tell us about this? Because you've done a lot of work sure. with this, right? Yeah, so I survey on privately owned land for this species because it has a very narrow native range. And it is go it's considered functionally extinct because it is no longer able to reach sexual maturity in the wild because of an introduced fungal pathogen, Fusarium torreae, which um, came over here in about the 40s. And by 1960, all of the mature trees died back to the ground. 
and all we have left are re-sprouts that continue to die back and then re-sprout and die back and re-sprout. And the uh, fungal pathogen likely evolved in China on other Trea species that are native to China. Right, because this is an old genus. It's been around for a long time. We're talking pre-angiosperm, pre-flower and plant. Yep. And so, yeah, the uh, species is can look, I mean, this one is fairly healthy. It can look like it has no symptoms until it's stressed for some reason. And that's why this cage is on it, because deer really love to rub on this species. And that causes stress. And then that can cause the, uh, the fungus to uh, break out and then kill the tree back to the ground. Do the needles again. smell good when they're crushed? Yeah, you the can California. Smell it. Smell it. They remind me of tomato plants. They smell oh, wow. like it's very yeah, it's really pungent, but kind of conifery too, kind of like like a, yeah, kind of like a like a tomato mixed with like a, a fir or something. So are these dioecious too, like the yes. California ones? So yes. plants are either male or female. Correct. And they can switch. That's one thing we've learned about this species, at least, is that they can switch from male to female or female to male. We, we're not sure yet exactly. How do they do that? They just do it. They just oh, switch no. in the middle. That's crazy. Something something triggers the formation of the of the uh, the uh, opposite uh, reproductive structure. Mm -hmm. So it's obvious, still in bloom. Look at it. So so Californica looks a lot like this, and these top out at what, like thirty feet, like the. Uh, yes. But you don't see you don't see big ones anymore. No, They're all gone. But they would get almost as wide. They'd be at least like fifteen feet wide when they were mature. Really Jesus. Wide. Yeah, because like big Christmas tree. Yeah, the ones in California look real nice. They got a real nice habit, just spreading. You know. So, so how do these do in cultivation? Are the people growing these in, in yards and well, stuff? That's a or? great question. And the reason for, uh, I would definitely recommend not planting them. You can grow them. You can grow them much further north. But this fungus, just recently we have found that it can spread to other genera. It spreads to suga, the native hemlock, and can kill hemlock. It also spreads to native pine species and can kill pines. So it's recommended not to plant this tree outside of its very narrow native range for that reason, because we don't want to, we want to prevent further extinctions of other species. Think this? You think that fungus possibly came in on cunning hemia? Well, so it's it's a, a generalist for conifers. It's this fusarium. I mean, it infects. Yeah, it infects other conifers, but it, we found it even infecting hardwood species as well. Not killing hardwood species, but affecting. So this fusarium don't care. It goes for anything. Yeah, it's pretty scary. And that's the big issue with the horticultural industry is, you know, you can bring plants from all over the world and move them around, but you don't know what else you're moving around besides just the plant. Right, because no species is an island. You you're, you could be mixing other things from that ecosystem. You're mixing a whole ecosystem. That's basically what you're doing. You're swa swapping ecosystems. Here's a nice one. Aesculus pavia. Sapindaceae, the maple family, the buckeyes. Another uh, another genus, you got uh, two species out west. You got Aesculus californica and an Aesculus perii down there in the deserts of Baja. A real weird tree. Anyway, pollinated by hummingbirds and butterflies. You see those red, somewhat tubular flowers. Big enough for a hummingbird to stick its schnoz in there, its little beak. Look at those orange, <coughs> that orange pollen grains on those anthers as well. And then, of course, those palmate leaves. All right, it always pisses me off. People, people plant European buckeyes. We got, we got like three or four great native ones. Maybe only three native, great native ones uh, in North America. Look at that. Here's a, here's a larger uh, Texas Floridana that you does not look happy. It looks pissed off. Something's knocking it back. What's going on there, huh? Got to die back all the way up. Yellowing leaves. Look at that bark too. Oh, real nice bark. This is nice. Talk about Hummer pollination. Nice. Erythrina herbacea. Okay, it's a pea. It's a Hummer pollinated pea. And they can get a lot taller than this. They get upwards of six, sometimes eight feet tall. Maybe this one got mowed. Who knows? But they got a big tuberous root down there. All right, like a lot of uh, perennial members of the family can do in, uh, in this region. All right, especially when you go west of Texas and uh, northern, uh, northern Mexico. Look at those. Look at those. You got like blue pollen on those anthers. All right. Ah, uh, coral beans, and then the, the beans, the actual, the seeds are like a bright red, all right? Pretty toxic, but, uh, God, what, a, what an impressive plant. See, was I lying? Look, there's the seeds at Erythrina. Get some nice ones in Arizona, too. There's a, there's a, another one that gets, uh, gets a little bit larger. And since we're on the topic of legumes, look at that. Baptisia alba, look at it. You got a nice bu big fat bumblebee hitting those flowers. Such a great genus. Get a few uh, in uh, coastal Texas, get a few in central Texas, uh, on up into the Midwest. 
think there's like there's got to be four or five species of baptisium, maybe more than that. You know, green calyx, white flowers, papilion, papilionaceous flowers, with the banner wings and keel. It's another modification of that banner wings and keel. See that banner, that top petal's folded over. You got the wing petals, and you got the yellow keel with all the stamens on the inside. Such a nice plant. You got those uh, trifolia leaves right there. Of course, it dies back. Look, look, the fruits are like kind of purple. Look like a little purple bean. Look at that. Even the fruits are nice to look at. Look at that. You know, waxy, slowly maturing. Even though that uh, that raceme is still going off. It is. Look how swollen those beans get. Looks like a little ass. Would it look like a little tail coming off of it? Look at that. You can see I'm wiping the wax off with my hands. There's those uh, trifid leaves, trifoliate leaves. Christ, it looks like they're going to be ready in like, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks or something. Easy plant to grow from seed, too. Still got the calyx on there above that ovary. Look, here you go, oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea cursifolia. There's that uh, dense panicle of flowers. You can see those bracts. Those aren't petals, they're just bracts. Just attractive bracts to attract pollinators to that entire panicle. And then all those uh, individual tiny flowers in a background right there. So, uh, kind of kind of odd. Just the distal flowers produce those... Uh, those sterile bracts, and then uh, that gets the pollinators into. You can see it's uh, it got, uh, I don't know, medium-sized shrub. It's got a woody stem, and of course that those uh, oak-looking leaves with that beautiful indumentum on the undersides of them. Look, you got hairs on the stem and everything too. Look at it, those opposite leaves, nice. Oh, look at it. You got a crepe myrtle, an invasive crepe myrtle. God, I hate these things. All the more reason to hate them. Okay, I hate them even when they're when they're places where they're not invasive. I mean, they're not native because they're not native to North America. They're not native everywhere, but not all non-natives are invasive. But uh, obviously here it is. It's wet enough and humid enough. It is. God, I hate this fucking plant. Uh, probably I'd like it where it's native 8,000 miles away, but here it's a pain in the ass. Here we go. Leatris gulsoni. I look at that. Endemic to the Florida panhandle. All right, these normally don't bloom till later in the year. Look at those corollas. Okay, Asteraceae is the family sunflower family. Got those black anther tubes. Got the styles poking out. All right, but uh, you know this this you get the phyllaries too and there was a capitula so that's acting like the uh, sunflower head with about I don't know three or four flowers in it looks like each each uh, capitulum only has four flowers four pink flowers look at those oh my god look at it. you could see those uh, those red hairs on it too that's the pappus all right such a cool genus wish we got more of these out west we don't there's uh there's one uh, liatris the uh, neo mexicani you get down there and uh and uh <clears throat> the uh, fizzle formation of west texas but that's it look at how broad those leaves are too for a liatris normally they just got grass shaped leaves all right very narrow leaves so many cool liatris out there elegans is probably the, the most banger of them all most wild looking one anyway there, there you go liatris galsonia how about that huh, look at look and a eupatoria tribe the stevia tribe see those long ass styles Good indicator of the stevia tribe, Eupatori. It's a good spot to end it, I guess. Jesus Christ, I can't, I can't believe I just ranted for nearly a freaking hour about plants. Anyway, have a good rest of your night. Go fuck yourself. Bye.